So if y'all want to turn your Bibles to James chapter 2, if I'm not mistaken, this is the second part in James chapter 2 that we've gone through. And there's going to be uh, maybe three or four part series in James chapter 2. Again, I'm just going to do a little quick recap or quick summary. What we did on chapter, I mean, what James was letting us know in chapter 1 is control your tongue. Right here and there, he hits on it. And one thing I like is uh, James is known to be like the Proverbs of the New Testament. He'll hit on something, hit on something else, and then go back to what he first hit on. And he jumps back around, and James does that. It's beautiful, right? And then you're going to start seeing again, he hit on James 1. I mean, in James chapter 1, the, about controlling your mouth, right? And if you don't control your tongue, then your religion is worthless. And then in chapter 2, about favoritism, about all these things. And then in chapter 3, you're going to see back again, when we get in chapter 3, how he hits on the tongue again. Just back and forth, right? So as we see here, we're on, we're going to be on 4 through 13. I don't know if we're going to make it all the way, but we're going to try to. And if we don't, we'll just put it on next week's one. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Whenever y'all find yourselves there, y'all want to stand for the reading of the Word of God? James 2, 5 to 13. James 2, 5 to 13. It's about favoritism. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Didn't God choose the poor in this road to be rich? in faith, and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him. Verse 6, Yet you have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you in into court? 7, Don't they blaspheme the good name that was invoked over you? Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Verse 9, If however, if however you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Verse 10. For whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you are a lawbreaker. Verse 12. Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not, excuse me, judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's the reading of the word of God. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, for your truth, for your promises, Lord God. Protect me, guide me from error, Lord Jesus. Protect me from error. Have your way with me. Have your way with our hearts today, Lord Jesus, that they may be receptive to your word, Lord God. And the seeds that will come out, which is your word, will be planted on fertile soil and will produce a crop of 30, 60, and 100 fold. That the way that we walked into those doors will leave different, Father God. We're receptive hearts, Father God, and we'll put it into action. James, you, your, your apostle James had said, be doers of the word. Not just hearers of the word. Not forgetting what we look like in your mirror, Lord God. So we thank you and we love you, Lord Jesus. We saw these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So what you're going to see here, brothers and sisters, what James had previously hit on, he said, be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. He hit, that, he hit on that on what we had previously went through. Not only that, he said, when God shows you the mirror, don't forget about what you look like. You go to the mirror and then you go on doing what you want to do and you forget what you look like. So you know what? When God shows you the mirror of His Word, when He shows you the mirror of His Word and you see yourself for who you are, okay, let me just break this down for the ones that didn't catch it the last time, right? When you go to a mirror, just like you did before this morning, I seriously doubt that any of you didn't go to the mirror this morning. Every one of you went to the mirror, I'm pretty, pretty sure, right? Probably a few times, right? So look at this. When God shows you the mirror of his word, I mean, when you went to the mirror this morning, when you saw something that wasn't right with your face or with your hair, 
right? You fixed it before you left. You didn't look at the mirror and say, oh, how cute. I'll make it to the day like that. You didn't, you didn't do that. You fixed what you saw, right? Okay, just like the same way when God shows you the mirror of yourself in Scripture, don't forget about what you look like. Don't wander off and go about your day and be like, that wasn't for me. That was for the person beside me. That was for the person that's on Zoom. That was for the person on YouTube that's going to hear it later. No, no, it's for you. You can't dodge it. So when God shows you yourself in the mirror of Scripture, He's showing you so that you change it. You know why? Because when you change it, you don't sin against Him no more. You glorify Him more. You look like Him more. He's shaping you in the, more and more like His image. So look at this, brothers and sisters. Four. Four and five. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Haven't you made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? Let's stop there. So James had previously said, don't show favoritism to a rich man that comes in. That has, He even breaks it down. He says, who has rings on and gold rings on and fine clothes and all this stuff. And then you say to the poor, come over here and sit. In this other place over here where nobody sees him by my footstool. He says, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't show favoritism like, like that. God doesn't do that to his people. The Bible says that God doesn't show any partiality. No favoritism. Right? So this is one thing when we say, at the cross of Christ, we're all on level ground. Whenever you're mirrored before Jesus, you all look, we all look bad. Right? So, okay. James is saying, don't show any partiality. Don't show any favoritism to anybody else. Not only this, and we're going to get to this in a minute. He not only does he say, he says, it's sin when you do that. Okay, and we talked about being, building barriers and bridges. When you start looking at people by what other people have said, by what you've heard, or what you see, or what you know about that person, you start building up these barriers instead of bridges because of what you know and heard and saw about these other people and they block you they block that person from coming more to God because you already did this and not only this he raises it up to another bar look what he goes on to say in verse 4 he says oh but okay check this out what if somebody says but I didn't treat that person ugly I was nice to them I didn't treat them ugly in that way I didn't say nothing mean to them good for you how do you get across this one look at verse 4 Two, four. Haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? He says, oh yeah, good for you. You didn't do it with your words. Yeah, but what about your thoughts? He says, I saw your thoughts. You judged them with your thoughts. Remember when he had told the Pharisee? He said, I think it's Simon. He said, Simon, why do you say these things in your heart? Why do you say these things in your heart? Don't judge people even by their thoughts. I mean, by your thoughts. Yeah, you may might not be doing these things. Don't think of yourself better than somebody else just by the way somebody looks or by the way you think of somebody. The way you think of somebody, you automatically, you're showing favoritism and you're putting them in this category on which we're, where you think that they belong. And no, before God, where do we all belong? We all deserve hell before God. How can you give them righteousness? How can you give them perfection? You can't. So before God, we're all on level ground. That's what James is hitting on. He says, don't do that. So as you see here, look, look at verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Notice this. So right there. People might be able to twist the scripture and say, well, God is showing partiality. He said, and God, didn't God promise that the poor are the ones that are going to be rich in faith? No, that's not what he's meaning. Let me break this down to y'all, the best of my ability. Brothers and sisters, it's like James wants us to know that the sin here that he's talking about, it's not the fancy lavish clothes or the fine jewelry or even the rich given a good seat. That wasn't the sin what we previously read last week. Right? Or the week before. The sin is that the person was showing partiality, was showing favoritism by his evil thoughts, 
That's what the sin was. He was showing favoritism by his evil thoughts. And James didn't want believers, the children of God, to behave just like the sinful world. He said, you know what, pretty much, if the road out there is going to be like that, let them be like that. But you don't do that in the household of God. Amen. He said, let the road do what it's going to do. The road's going to supposed to do that. But you don't do that, you that have been born again. Do not show partiality. What if God did that with you? You would never meet the requirements of God. We would never meet them, brothers, sisters, and friends. We would never meet God's requirements. And you're going to see how James breaks this down. So he says pretty much, he's like, you did it by your evil thoughts. And you know what's scary? This is scary for all of us. No one can escape this. You know no one knows your thoughts. And look at how much we still do them, knowing the only one that does know them can see everything. That's some scary stuff. You know no one knows your thoughts. And some of those thoughts you wouldn't even share with your husband, your wife, your friend, your girlfriend, whatever it is. You know why? Because if you share those evil thoughts, they would think that you're probably a creep. <laughs> or you're probably a weirdo. You, you, I'm being real. And, but, but you know why? Because it's true. You know why I'm saying that? Because I know the thoughts that come in my mind are not all of God. But you know what? In the name of Christ, you have authority over my thoughts and say, that's not from God. I'm going to do what God wants me to do, not what my thoughts are telling me to do. I don't want to think what's right. I want to know what's right by God. Like, oh, I think this is right. Let me just go and do this. No. The majority of the world thinks that they're doing what's right. So don't ever look at what the majority is doing and do that. You know what you should do? Like I say, look at what the people that are not the majority. Look at what they're doing and probably do that. The majority of the world is not doing the things of God. You know that. So look at the opposite. Look at what the other people are doing and probably do that. Right? So that's what I'm saying. So that's what's scary is you know how evil your thoughts are. You know why? You know why I know this is true? I know this is true because you're the one that has them. You're the one that has your evil thoughts. No one can tell you, hey, let me control your evil thoughts. Where do they come from? If they're evil thoughts, they don't come from God. That's what I'm saying. Because when the enemy can control your mind, he can control your body. And when he controls your body, he's like a little puppet in his hand, man. But with the power of God, you can say, you know what, enemy? I'm not going to do that. I've been saved by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not where I am, but I know where I'm going. You know what? I know there's some stuff in my life that needs to go. And I'm going to stop making excuses for the stuff in my life so that it can go. Because when I see the mirror of myself in light of the scripture, I don't like what I see and I want it to change. But if you like what you see, then you're going to keep being this person that keeps looking at themselves and doesn't change what they see. Makes sense, right? It came out good. That wasn't even on the notes. Amen. So praise God. Look at this. That's for me. So look at, James didn't want the unbelieving, I mean the believers to be acting like the unbelieving world inside the church of God. The Bible says this, that judgment begins with the household of God. If it begins with us, what is he going to do to the unbelieving world? People say, man, brother, you're pushing bullets. What do you mean? That's what the Bible says. It says judgment must begin with the household of God. If it begins with us, what's going to happen to the godless sinner? The sinner without God. So you know what? People say, but I'm saved by grace. Exactly. So you're the sinner covered by, I mean, you're the sinner covered by grace. And if you're covered by grace, the grace should be changing your life. That's how you know you're under grace. If your life does not change, you're not under grace. The grace that does not change your life, Spurgeon once said. The grace that does not, write this down, remember this, share this with your friends and your loved ones. The grace that does not change your life will not save your soul. That's how you know you're under grace because your life keeps changing. You're like, oh, I'm under grace. Oh, so, it's a, so the way you use grace is just a cup up for you to sin. You know what Paul says? No. Should we keep sinning so that grace abounds? Absolutely not, he says. So look at this. As we keep going. James didn't want that to be in the household of God if the judgment begins with us. MacArthur hit on something like this. He didn't want us, the believers, to behave like the sinful world by catering to the rich and prominent the important people of the world's eyes, 
The poor people in the world, he didn't want us that. He didn't want that. And shunning the poor and common people. Brothers and sisters, how many times have you been caught up passing judgment by worldly standards? Brothers and sisters, please, please, I beg you. Please don't be that Christian that professes obedience to Jesus Christ, but are defiled, but are defiled by your own conduct. Don't be that. Don't be that Christian. Don't be that Christian that everybody can say, well, look at he does it. Don't, don't be that Christian. That, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ, but you do the things that God hates. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. I'm not preaching sinless perfection here. You're never going to be perfect on this side of heaven. But you know one thing? You'll strive for it. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you'll want to be, right? And whenever you're not, you'll be convicted to be because you see the mirror of, of how you look like and you don't like what you see. You don't like what you hear from people telling you, hey, brother, maybe you shouldn't have said that. Hey, sister, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. You know, and you know what? The Bible says only a fool rejects correction. You know why I love blaming it on God? Nobody can get mad at me. So I love blaming it on God. Because if I would have said this, hey, they said, Brother Chitty said you're a fool because you rejected correction. Everybody would be mad at me. They'd hang me at dawn, right? Look at this. But when I say God says only a fool rejects correction, you can't get mad at me. And then you check your heart because you look at your mirror and you're like, God said that. Did he really say that? Check the scriptures. He did. He said that. So as I'm saying, at the end of the day, that's why I love it. Whenever people call me to go preach somewhere and call my brothers to go preach somewhere and I come straight from the word of God, I tell them, you don't got a problem with me. You got a problem with the word of God. I didn't write it. I just read it. I just read it. Like, oh, but that's your interpretation. What do you mean my interpretation? I just read it. I don't even have to interpret it. That's what it says. It's right. It's not, it, people want to make it feel like it's like, like this. Like, do you know whenever I was growing up, when I was growing up, like uh, these BB guns, these Red Rider BB guns were real famous. Right, and they'll send you like this little, whatever Brother Eric might even know, right, this little compass, and you got to move with little clicks to the right and clicks to the left, and they'll give you this little code, and you read these things, right? They, people would act like that's the word of God, like, oh, click, click to the left. Oh, this, we deciphered it. No, it's, sometimes it's so plain, right? It's so plain. But then they all oh, know. I wonder what he really means. I think it's pretty clear. James is saying, don't show favoritism. James is saying, when you look at yourself in the mirror, fix what you see. Don't go out and forget what you look like. James saying, watch your tongue. People say, oh, how do you interpret that? Watch your tongue. Right? James says, if you don't control your tongue, your religion is worthless. James 1.26. Well, oh, how do you interpret that? If you don't control your tongue, your religion is worthless. That's what it's pretty much saying. Right? It's simple, practical Christianity. Practical Christian living. He's saying, this is what a Christian should live like. Right? Now that I pricked your heart a little bit by the word of God, look at this. Now, you know what? you got to till up that dirt. Now, the seed will be planted on fertile soil. So look at this. So you see here, brothers and sisters, how many times have we been caught up passing judgment by worldly standards? Like I said, please don't let that be you. Where people, where Christians will profess obedience to Jesus Christ, but are defiled by our own conduct. We're defiled by the way that we live. Don't be that person. Brothers and sisters and friends, our speech and our conduct will give us away. They'll give you away. I promise you, I'm going to show you. Your speech and the way you live will give you away. It'll give you away. How are you identified by your speech and your conduct? How does it give you away? Can people know that you're a Christian? By the way you talk and by the way you live, by the way you walk. Does it give you away? Look at this. You know, when it does give you away, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Right? Notice this. Whenever you're witnessing to somebody and they think you're of the world, I get that a lot because I look like I'm of the world, but I'm not. Right? Check this out. My wife tells me, why do people come up to you all the time and ask you for drugs? I was like, well, I know what I look like. Look at me. I told my wife, I know what I look like. My wife was like, no, baby, it's not like that. I was like, don't try to come for me. I know exactly what I look like. <laughs> like, don't try to come for me. I was like, I look like I know where the plug's at. Like, that's what I'm saying. But that's not me no more. Right? They'll come up to me and they'll tell me, like, hey, hey, you know what? I'm like, dude, I don't even know you. No, I know where you can find Jesus. That's not what I'm looking for. Right? But this is what I'm saying. Right? And my wife was like, why did, it, why did this happen to you everywhere we go? It's like, look what I look like. Like, I know what I look like. She's like, no, it's not that big. Like, no, it is that. I know exactly what it is. So check this out. One thing that I see is 
I was just out somewhere just the other day, right? And I'm there, and I'm standing beside this dude's truck, and I'm coming to him in his truck. I like trucks, right? I like older trucks. I'm talking about his truck, and he's, and he's busting out these ba 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 curse words, left and right, left and right, right? In my head, I'm just standing there and hearing him out. Hey, man, my bro, hey, man. Right? And then all I did is bust out a card. Here you go, my bro. I like to share Jesus everywhere I go. I was like, can I share Jesus with you? And this is, what, this is, this is how you know he was receiving. I didn't even get to talk no more. He touched me on the arm. He's like, hey, bro. And I'm still talking to him. And he's like, hey, 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 bro, uh, forgive me for my language. Hey, Amen. You know why? Because your conduct will give you away. Automatically, he knew, like, man, I thought this dude was like me of the road. Like, no, I'm not. But you can come on this side, too, though. You can come on this side, too. But look at this. It gives you away. And where you're going to see this at is look at this. Brothers and sisters, our speech and conduct will give us away. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Where do we see this? My brother Jesse is quick at this. Go to Matthew 26 and mark this down in your Bible. Where your speech and conduct will give you away. Matthew 26, 69 through 74. Like I said, how are you identified by your speech? How does it give you away? That can be a good thing or a bad thing. Matthew 26, 69 through 74. Matthew 26, 69 through 74. So we'll read this together. Look at how your speech can give you away in your conduct. Right here. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl. Look at this. A servant girl. Other translation might say a slave girl. A servant girl approached him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. Verse 71. When he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told, told those who were there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. Check this out, 72. And again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. Peter's saying these things. Look at 73. After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, you really are one of them, since even your speech, even your accent gives you away. He says, you're really one of them. I can tell you've been by them. He's like, the way your accent is, you're one of them. You're one of them. Check this out, man. I got chills on me. The way you talk, brothers and sisters, can people say, you're one of them. You're one of them Christians that ain't those fake ones. You're one of those ones that are real because when I get around you, my body don't like what some, some of the things you say, but my spirit is receiving it, right? Can people do that around you? He's like, you know what? I know you're one of them. I know you've been with Jesus because of the way you talk. I know you've been with Jesus because of the way you're living, right? They knew Peter right away. Check this out. Let's keep going. Look at 74. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath. I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows. You would deny me three times. And he went away outside and wept bitterly. Look at this. As you keep going. Like I said, just by your speech... Will people know that you're a servant of Christ by the way you talk? Guzik, another commentator. Brothers and sisters, one thing that you see in the church, one thing that you see in church history, that more people than, look at, that more poor people than rich people have responded to the gospel. More poor people than rich people have responded to the gospel. Look at verse 6 and 7. Look at 6 and 7. Yet you have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you off into court? Don't they blaspheme the good name that was invoked over you? This doesn't mean that the poor automatically get into heaven and the rich automatically are going to hell. One thing that it can mean is that, and one thing that is, it's true, is that the poor are more aware of their powerlessness. Notice this. Whenever Christ saved you, notice how powerless you were. Notice how broken you were. Notice how poor you were. Poor spiritually. And broken. And many times, in that case, it's easier. Notice this. 
It is easier for people that are in that situation to acknowledge your need for salvation. Brothers and sisters, when you're in that situation, you see how much you need a Savior. You see how far you are from salvation. And it has you cling to the only one that can save you. That died for your sins. Jesus, God in the flesh. That was born of a virgin. That went onto the cross, carrying your sins. Screaming, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those secret sins that you don't think that no one knows, God knows them. You know why he knows them? Because he paid for them on the cross. But the thing is, are you going to accept the payment? If that's you today and you're not right with God, you can either accept it or you can pay for it yourself. One or the other. Somebody has to pay for it. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. God is paying us in death. Christ died. He, he paid for it. You can accept the payment from Jesus Christ. Check this out. Like I hit on one of the other sermons. The only time that God added something to his nature when he was able to add humanity to his nature, he, he could have picked to be the richest person on the face of the earth. The most powerful person on the face of the earth. He picked to be a poor person humble man and took the slave, I mean took the person, I mean, took the position of a servant and was born in a manger where animals eat or some of us wouldn't even go close to and would be very judgmental. God picked that place and wrapped himself in flesh lived a sinless life that you couldn't live gave himself as an offering to God the Father had the wrath of God poured on him full force. It took God to pay for your sin. To build that bridge back so that you can walk back to God. And he said on that cross, it is finished. He got done paying for your sin. So the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you won't be sinless. He paid for it all. But you will live a life that sins less. Brothers, sisters, and friends, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the great barriers that keeps rich, the rich, from receiving salvation is pride. You see this? And the reason is because it is easier to put your faith and trust in yourself when you're rich. It's easier for the enemy to get you to believe that you're okay. And get you to waste your time and never come to the Lord. Because you get entangled by the snares of of your own riches. Notice this. Notice when you get money or you have money or whatever it is. Notice how easy it is to get away from God. Do you know where you see, do you know where you see Jesus talking about something like this? Go to Mark 4, 18 and 19. Mark this in your Bible. Mark 4, 18 and 19. Look at what Jesus says about riches. Mark 4, 18 and 19. Look at 18. And you read this whole passage when you get a chance, the parable of the sower. Others are like seeds sown among the thorns. These are the ones, it says, these are the ones who hear the word. 19, but, but the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. Brothers and sisters, the riches of the world will choke you out where you become unfruitful. People say, well, I'm not rich. How was your walk with God? Are you rich in faith? Saying, well, oh, well I'm poor though, so that, I guess that doesn't apply to me. Let me say, if you, you got more than one set of clothes, you're pretty rich compared to other countries. You got, a, like I said, you got a little box inside your house that has like a little handle and has like all these numbers on there that I don't even know how to fully use yet all the time. Right? And then you push it and it makes this noise and it heats up your food and stuff like that. That's called a microwave. You're doing pretty well. Right? You got a vehicle that has four tires and then you're able to get to place to place. You're doing pretty well compared to these other countries. Right? Pretty rich. How many times do our riches keep us from God? Check this out. Brothers and sisters, this is true. And you know what? The poor have more opportunities to trust in God. 
because they don't have the riches taken over them. They have more opportunities to trust in God. For, the, for that reason, this result, for that reason, this result, they are more, they are far more rich in faith than the rich person is. I love this commentary that I want to share with you. The rich man, the rich man may trust in Jesus Christ. Pay attention to this. The rich man may trust in Jesus Christ, but the poor man must trust in Jesus Christ. The rich man may. They may believe there's a God, but the poor man must trust in Jesus Christ to provide for his every need. Look at this. Brothers and sisters, you see this in Scripture, that riches many times are an obstacle and are a barrier and a stumbling block from keeping people from reaching the kingdom of God. Look at the rich young ruler. You know the story. Go sell your riches and come follow me. He left away all sad. Right? Look at Zacchaeus. Very rich. Tax collector. If he wanted to climb that tree and saw Jesus, he would have died in his sin. Look at Matthew. Another tax collector. Look at the Pharisees. Look how easy it is to slip away from God due to wealth. It creeps in so easy because the majority of the time, riches come with the world. And where you see this, I want to hit on this really fast before we wrap this up. Go to 1 Kings 10, 23 to 27. Look at this. Riches come with the world many times. Solomon was one of the most richest men in the face of the earth. And you're going to see what happened with Solomon. 1 Kings 10, 23-27. King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the world in riches, look at this, in riches and wisdom. The whole world wanted, wanted an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. 25. Every man would bring his annual tribute Items of silver and gold, clothing and weapons, spices and horses and mules. Look at this. 26. Solomon accumulated 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen and stationed them in the chariot cities with the king in Jerusalem. That's a lot of stuff. And not only that, you got to provide for those animals. Look at this. Those who are ranchers, my brother Bob and people, you know what that is. That's a lot of stuff, Right? He said, you're going to have no time for yourself. Look at this. That may, might be a good thing. Not for Solomon. Look at this. And stationed them in the chariots and cities in the king of Jerusalem. 27. The king made a silver... Look, look at what verse 27. This is always freaking me out. Look what verse 27 says. The king, this meaning Solomon, made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. And he made cedar as abundant as sycamore. Let's just stop there. He was so rich that silver was as common as you were picking up a rock. That's how rich he was. Look what else. Second Chronicles 1. You say, where are you going with this, Tootie? Second Chronicles 1, 11 and 12. You're hanging with me. Second Chronicles 1, 11 and 12. Look at this. Look at about Solomon again. God said to Solomon, since this was in your heart and you have not requested riches, Wealth or glory, or for the life of those who hate you. Look, at, look how beautiful this is and how scary. And you have not even requested long life, but you have requested for yourself wisdom and knowledge that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Verse 12. Wisdom and knowledge are given to you. I will also give you riches and wealth and glory unlike what was given, in, what was given to the king's who are before you, or will be given to those after you. Brothers and sisters, God is saying, you know what, since you didn't ask for riches and wealth, in a long life, I'm going to give you so much riches from the kings that were before you and the kings that were after you. I'm going to give you so much riches since you didn't ask for it. So it sounded pretty humble, right? Look at what happens as we end with Solomon. 1 Kings 11, 1 through 11. Look at this. 1 Kings 11, 1 through 11. King Solomon loved many foreign women. Oops. Looks like Solomon's going on the wrong path. Right? He stopped tending to his horses and stuff. King Solomon loved many foreign women. 
in addition to Pharaoh's daughter, even Pharaoh's daughter, Moabite, Ammonite, and uh, Edom, uh, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. Verse 2, from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, and they must not intermarry with you because they will turn you, look, at, they will turn your heart away to follow their gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 who were concubines, and they turned his heart away. Verse 4, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord, his God, and his father David, as his father David had been. Verse 5, Solomon followed Asheroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Milcom, I'm glad I can't pronounce all these demonic names, right? Milcom, the, uh, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, unlike his father David. He did not remain loyal to the Lord. Verse 7, at that time Solomon built, right here, at that time Solomon built a high place for Shemash, the abhorrent idol of Moab. And for Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites of the hill across from Jerusalem. He did the same thing. He did the same for all his foreign wives who were burning incenses and offering sacrifices to their gods. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He made he had commanded him about this so that he would not follow other gods, but Solomon did not do what the Lord had commanded. Check this out. The Lord blessed him with so much riches. Bless him with so much things that he didn't even ask for, but he gave it to him. And you know what Solomon did? He did exactly what God told him not to do. Don't go chase after women. They're going to turn your hearts away from me. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to just go after a couple of them. I'm going to go after hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. And you know what? It said that they turned his heart away from the Lord. And you know what happened? Solomon was rich and wealthy. And you know what he did? He used his riches to make little gold idols and then started worshiping these idols. Moloch, do you know what some of the sacrifices of Moloch required? That, was, that wasn't even a god, that was a demon? Sacrifices of babies. Shamash, the other god that he was worshiping? Sacrifices of babies too, infants. Can you imagine Solomon? In my head, I'm thinking if he was worshiping, he's probably doing this stuff. In the Bible, they talk about some of the people that were burning their children to these gods. I'm not, I'm not making it gruesome, this is for real. One of them, one of those gods, I think if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, Moloch, they would burn his arms, if I'm not mistaken. They would get him so hot, the arms, and they would have people playing the drums so loud. Why would they play the drums so loud? So when they would burn the arms of the statue that they made, the arms would be so hot, and they would throw the babies onto these arms, and the babies would be screaming, screaming, and they will play the drums so you couldn't hear the cries of the babies. That's what Solomon started worshiping. Check this out. People may say, why? It wasn't a bad Solomon. Check this out. But the riches that God has given you, how do they lead you away from God? How do they lead you away from God? How are you using them for God and for the glory of God and for the advancement of the kingdom of God? Ouch or amen. Right? That hits. Yeah, you ain't as bad as Solomon. What I'm saying, God appeared to Solomon twice. And look what he still did. Christ died for you and arose on the third day. Where's our walk with Jesus today? Who's he in your life? Look at this. We keep going. And on the other hand, it's like the poor and the broken are more, have a more opportunity to trust in Jesus. Look at the people who had leprosy. Jesus hung around the people with leprosy. The blind, the mute, the lame, the deaf. Look at the women with the bleeding disorder. Look at the immoral woman caught in adultery. Look at the immoral woman at the well. And the list goes on and on. Let me share this with you. You know how scary riches are? And I'm not saying riches are bad. I'm saying they can be bad. They, the majority of the time, riches lead people away from God. They do. That's what, you see that clearly in the scripture. I'm not saying go and burn all your money. I'm not saying that. I'm saying just be careful with riches. There was 6,000. You may not need to know this, but I'm going to let you know this so, you, so that you can use it later on. In the Bible, in Jerusalem, at the time of Jesus' time, there was 6,000 Pharisees. 6,000 Pharisees. You know how many the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, speak of getting saved? 
One. One got saved out of 6,000. And they were rich, mighty men. One got saved out of 6,000. It's crazy. Look how rich. Look how rich has changed you. They'll put you in a high class. They'll put you in middle class. Brothers and sisters, James's readers at this time had dishonored the poor because they didn't treat them the way God treats them. You see this clearly. And we don't have to go there. In Luke's account, Luke 7, you don't go there. Luke's account, remember with the woman that came in and anointed Jesus and was crying and weeping at his feet? And then the Pharisees said only if he was a prophet he would know what kind of woman's touching him? And what did Jesus say? Look at her sins, there are many. But they're forgiven. She loves much because she's been forgiven much. Simon the Pharisee didn't think he needed to be forgiven. He was dressed to impress. He had money. He had his wealth. Why am I going to listen to this prophet that don't even look like a prophet? Only if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman's touching him. And you know what Jesus busted out? Simon, why do you say this in your heart? Boom, I just picture Simon getting jaw jacked spiritually. You know why? Because he read Simon's. Because you know what? He was greater than a prophet. He read his mind. A prophet would listen to what God told them to say. Jesus is God. He already knew what he was thinking in his heart. He said, why do you say this in your heart, Simon? So we keep going. Where the poor were being ignored and talked about. She was being ignored and talked about. Not just by people's mouths. They were not just by people's mouths. Look at verse 4 again. James 2, 4. Haven't you made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? By the thoughts. Brothers and sisters, none of us have been forgiven little. We all, we all have been forgiven much. But we portray an attitude of pride when we treat each other without honor. Quote by John Calvin. To dishonor the poor is to dishonor those who God honors. And is doing so, look, in doing so, in doing so, if you do this, we invert the order of God. We turn it upside down. The God says, do it this way. Then, no, let me turn it upside down. Let me do it this way. Verse 6. 2 6. You have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Look at this. You know what's a trip? Notice this. Notice the majority of the times in the world. Aren't the rich are the ones that drag you into court? Aren't the rich the ones that are mean to you? Aren't the rich the ones that demand their way because they're high and mighty? Check this out. Notice this. Notice if we're in our church here today. And Michael Jordan was sitting on one side of you. And Oprah Rimpery on the other side of you. Even though you may say, oh, I don't like watching Oprah. I guarantee you, check this out. You would act some type of way. Notice how our flesh... Once we know, at times, that there's rich people in the room, it makes you act different. And these are the people that blaspheme the name of God. We know what Oprah believes in. I'm saying, look at this. Look at how we do this. This is what was happening at that time, and it's still happening today. If they're going to do that, let them, let them do that. But that's not in the household of God. We're going to love everybody equally. So you see here. So when we're reading this question on 6, we must remember James' original case, like in verse 2, what we said of unbelievers. Or we can say that these people that were coming into the church, what James was talking about, had much faith. Oh, I mean, excuse me, we didn't know much about their faith. He said they were rich, they had rings, they had these things, they gave them a, fine, a nice seat, and the poor, they made them sit over here. We don't know much about their faith. Well, let me tell you this. Let me tell you, you know, the, you know why I know this? One thing that we can apply to this. Let's get, let me get off track a little bit. How are you being the light to those people? How are you being the light to the rich? How are you being the light to the poor? How are you using what God has given you? Like I said, you won't find that here at this church. We show favoritism to people like that. We're all equal before God. We're going to live that way. We're going to do life together. We're all equal before God. But let me tell you this. 
How are you being a light to these people, the rich or the poor, that they can that they can know, so that they can know you, so that they can know your Creator more? How are you going out of your way, brothers, sisters, and friends? How are you, as a believer, going out of your way to make them feel comfortable, rich or poor? How are you going out of your way to make yourself feel comfortable? And the one sad thing, I watched this pastor do, and it was convicting. I'm really getting closer to an end. My brother, Deputy, uh, not so much as he likes that. Let's check this out. It's just sad what happened. This pastor over this mega church, right, he put a video camera inside of his church, right, and after service, and he's well known all around the world. I'm not even going to say his name. Right? He went all around the road and he put up in his church. So after service, and there was a, a young teenage boy in there who had a lip earring and these things in his lip. And, and he was coming to church and the Lord's working on him, man. Praise God that he's there. Right? And he, there was this table there. And he went and sat on the table, the pastor did. And the young boy's over there and he's talking to the young boy. And everybody keeps coming to the pastor and, hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? And he's like, you want to? And he's playing back the video for the whole church to see. He's saying, hey, you want to talk? He's reenacting the video again. He's like, oh, you want to talk to my friend? Oh, no. no. They're just all saying hi to the pastor, and they're leaving the, the guy just standing there alone. But they're all coming to the pastor. They're all coming to the pastor or to the other Christians, and this guy that's coming to church is sitting there alone. How messed up is that? How messed up is that, man? That broke my heart. So what we see here, 8 and 11, as we, I'm going to wrap up. 8 through 11. Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. He says you are doing well. Look at 9. If however you show favoritism, you commit sin. People, people may say like, hey, you know what, that's not part of the commandments. Look what he says there. He says, you, you don't commit murder? You don't commit adultery? Fine. That's good. Paraphrasing this. Look at this. However, if you show favoritism, you're in sin. He's saying, you're in sin and convicted by the law as a transgressor. You know why? Because how are you loving your neighbor if you're doing that? For whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, 11, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery but you murder, are you a law, aren't you a lawbreaker? Check this out. You don't have to break Deputy Jesse knows this. Brother Jesse knows this. Is whenever you break the law or you go to jail, you go to prison or you get a ticket, right? They don't say, hey, you only broke this one thing. You're doing good. No, whenever in court, they're saying he broke the law. He broke the law. They don't have to. Of course, they're going to find out what you broke, what part of the law you broke. But you broke the whole thing. You're called a lawbreaker. Check this out. Let me break this down. Like I said in 12 and 13, James is saying pretty much, he's saying this pretty much. You keep the entire law, but don't do, and don't do this means you're guilty of breaking the entire law. He says, you do this, but you don't do this. Good for you, but you just broke the entire law. You broke it all. Look at it this way. Let's say that you are tied up with a chain. Let's use this. You're tied up with a chain on top of a building. I heard this from Brother in Christ. On top of a building, and you're tied up with a chain, and the chain has all these links on this chain, and it's tied around your waist, and you're hanging off the side of a building, right? And all these links are linked up, right? It doesn't matter if one link, two links, five links, ten links broke. You would fall to your death, right? No matter how many links broke between you and the top of the roof. It didn't matter if the first link broke at the top or the last link that's tied to your waist broke. You, it's broken. That's what happens when God says, you break one, you break them all. You have broke them all. How many, have, how many times have we been there? You break one, you break them all. He says, oh, you want to keep the law? Try keeping them all flawlessly. There's only one that did. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Never broke anyone in the link. That's tied to God. You know what? This chain is linked, tied to God. The moment you disobeyed God, you broke the link and you're, you cannot get to God. Christ is those links that lead you to God. That kept them all. That kept them all. 
So you see here, in the same way, God is saying, if you break one, one part of the law, you're guilty of breaking them all. And the other reason that favoritism is so bad, brothers and sisters, is because it affects how God judges us. What James is saying, if you want God to show mercy, how he judges you, look at 13, as we end. 13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who, to the one who has shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Brother Jesse, you want to go to Matthew 7 too? What James is saying here, if you want God to show mercy how he on how he judges you and disciplines you, then you must show that same mercy to other people and avoid showing favoritism. Look at Matthew 7 too. Look at the words of Christ. For you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others and will be measured by the same measure you use. Brothers and sisters at times, you know what it is? At times, whenever you mess up and you do these things, don't you want God to show you mercy when it's you? You want God to show you mercy and grace because in your mind you don't think like you're as bad as the other person or you're in as much sin as the other person, right? So you can tell, and you want like you want the, like the dump truck of mercy dumped on you, right? But check this out. But whenever you feel like somebody's been in some grievance sin or whatever, check this out. You know what you do? You bust out the spoon and say, "Here's enough mercy for you. You only get a teaspoon of it, but I get the whole dump truck." Check this out. God says you're going to be measured by the same measurement that you judge. The Bible says this. Go look it up on your own. It says this on Judgment Day that you're going to have to give an account for every idle word you said. So why is James saying, watch this how we speak. It says, you know what? Mercy triumphs over. It triumphs over that. God had mercy on you. And it triumphed over everything you've ever did. His grace prevailed because of what he's given you by the finished work on Calvary. That you're able to receive his mercy and grace. Whenever you get disciplined, don't you kind of want the lightest discipline? Even though we say, no, I really don't deserve the lightest discipline. You, you really want the lightest. You don't want God to discipline you hardcore. You know that. Right? You know that. Right? But even at times when he disciplines you lightly, you feel you're in yourself. I don't even deserve it. I don't even deserve to, for it to be that light and that loving. And it melts, your heart, it melts your heart to be more sensitive to the word of God. Don't it? Don't it? Whenever you see yourself that way and you see how patient and how merciful and how kind and how gentle, was, how, how gentle God was to you at that moment. Right? But too much was given, much is required. It says if you do know and then you keep doing this stuff, more stripes will be given to you. But if you don't know, so brothers and sisters, don't show favoritism by the way you judge other people, even by your thoughts. Don't do that. God don't do that to us. When he gives you grace and mercy, he gives you grace and mercy. He don't do it with a spoon. It comes through Christ Jesus, endless. So how are you doing that today? If you have these evil thoughts in your mind, tell God, why are they coming in? Why? Is there something in your heart is there things of the world that are coming in that you want? And that are blocking you? And that are causing you to do this? Tell God, help me. I see myself here in the light of Scripture and I don't like what I see. And I can't do it without you, Jesus. And I promise you, like that, Jesus will come for you. He'll come to your aid. You know why? If you're his child, why wouldn't a good God come for the child that he paid for? Why would, he die? Why would he die for your sins and then not tend to you every step of the way? That's not our God. If you paid for your sin and you received it by repenting and believing the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you're God's and you will obey what he tells you to do. And you know what First John says? His laws ain't burdensome to you. They're not going to be a burden to you. They're going to break you when you don't keep them. That's what it is, brothers and sisters. When, if God showed you grace and mercy, show that to other people too. I'm not saying tolerate their sin. I'm not saying that. If people are in sin and continue in sin, I'm confronted, yes, in love and truth and boldness. I'm not saying this is... 
doesn't make, I mean, excuse me, it doesn't equal, let me tolerate their sin. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, if God has shown you mercy, show that to other people too. Be the light of Christ to them. Let your light shine bright. Brothers and sisters, I love you all. Let's sit in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the mercy that you have shown me, that you've shown my brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you finish work on Calvary? How merciful and kind you were to me. And yet while we were still sinners, you died. And you arose on the third day proven that the payment was paid in full. When you said it is finished. You said into your hands I commit my spirit, Father. Lord Jesus, I thank you for being our Savior. Forgive us where we fail you. Help us, lead us, direct us, and guide us. Thank you for showing us the mirror and what we look like so we don't forget and we change it. I pray that when we walk out those doors today, we won't forget about what we heard. And we'll change the things that we need to change. And we can only do it through you, Lord Jesus. So help us where we're failing you, where we fall short of the glory of God. We thank you for your grace and mercy that begins in you every day. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's praise him.